Hello, I am Marga Gray and I just want to tell you a little bit more about Kaori Kids. So um, to explain Kaori Kids, I need to explain sensory processing disorder. So sensory processing disorder is a condition in which the brain has trouble receiving information and responding to this information that comes through the senses. It can come from the environment and it can come from the body itself. So we have eight senses that tells us about the environment outside the body. The first one is vision, then hearing or auditory, taste, smell, and touch. So those are all telling us about everything that goes on around the body, outside the body. The skin is very, very important because it tells us about the environment, but it's very close to the body. So the brain perceives it as very important. If something happens on the skin, the brain goes into high alert very, very quickly. Then we also have sensations that tell us about what's going on inside the body. And I'm going to name three of them. The one is the sense of body position. You don't have to look to see that your feet are on the floor or not. You don't have to, to feel whether your bum is on the seat or not. You can, you know it. So um, that is your sense of proprioception. Um, and then the next one is the sense of movement. So this boy is running and the vestibular sense is registered in our inner ears. And that tells us about the movement in which direction the body is moving. So even if your eyes are closed, you can feel whether you're going forward, backwards, turning, whatever. You can feel that without vision. And that is your vestibular system. It also helps you to maintain your balance. Then the, the eighth sense is the sense of interoception. And that tells us what is going on in the body regarding body functions like heart rate. Um, your anxiety levels, breathing, um, are you hungry? Do you need to visit the toilet? Um, and we see kids that have problems with that and then they, they find it really difficult to read the body signs. And I'm saying kids, but adults can have the same conditions and they have just learned how to live with it. So sensory processing disorder is the umbrella term for sensory modulation disorder, sensory based motor disorders and sensory discrimination disorder. The discrimination one I'm not going to talk about because it's not, it's more for therapists. Modulation disorder is the one that um, some people are more sensitive to sensations than others. Some people don't like certain textures on their skin. Some people don't like spicy food. Others love spicy food. Some people love to go to a party with lots of noise and people and chatting and music. Other people prefer to go to a quiet restaurant, one-on-one -on -one dinner with a friend or somebody special. And um, so we are all different regarding our sensations. And I'm just going to explain to you the, the sensory thresholds. So if you have high thresholds, then you are less sensitive. Low thresholds are more sensitive. Most of us function between the two. When you are tired, you might have a lower threshold. You might be a little bit more irritable. Tell the kids, ah, oh, don't don't be so loud, please. And on the other day, when you're rested, you come in and say, oh, I love the song that you're singing. Can I join in? Then you don't mind that. Okay, so when you have a high threshold, you are usually sensory seeking in some way. Um, you often have a low registration for what is going on around. It's limited awareness. Um, my example is the day that um, I was in the car with my husband and I said to him, what is this lorry doing, this truck, sorry, this truck doing um, next to the road? Um, and he said, that truck has been there for a month. 
but I haven't seen it. So my my awareness is not that good, not for things that I'm not interested in. I would have seen the flower blooming behind the truck. Anyway, um, these people often have a poor attention span, but they are often not seen by teachers and others because they don't bother others. They don't, they don't disturb the class. They will sit in their corner daydreaming, looking out of the window, looking as if they know what's going on, but they might not have any clue. They can be movement seekers. They can be very active. They use that activity to stay awake and to, to be a little bit more alert. The people with the low thresholds, are typically sensory avoiders. They don't like the loud music. Don't touch me. Um, very sensitive to smell sometimes. They can be very good chefs, by the way, but they might be the picky eaters. Um, and they can be oversensitive, anxious, and defensive. So they might lash out without thinking, especially the little boys. Um, they are often in the fight flight um, mode um, and they are easily alert, um, very alert and easily overwhelmed. So they are difficult people to take to malls and markets and events and these are, are easier to take. Okay, so the sensory modulation is right at the bottom of development. On top of that, you get your sensory motor skills. So this sensory modulation develops when, from before birth. Um, sensory mod motor skills um, mainly develops up to two years. That's the time the child develops from lying down as a newborn baby to being able to walk on tiptoes and run around two to three years um, and then on top of that your perceptual skills develop um, and that is to identify up and down left and right circle or oval a or o Th those differences are the per perceptual skills and then um, you get your cognitive skills which is your problem solving memory um, yeah, yes, fine motor skills can, can um, be there. Um, and then on top of that, you get your academic learning. So the academic learning is successful because all these skills are well developed. And I compare that to an iceberg. If there are cracks underneath the surface of the water in that iceberg, there will be cracks and holes in the top or the iceberg might fall apart. And the same happens here. If there are cracks in the development or gaps in the development of the child down here, then you see it in class and with academic learning. <clears throat> so these are all the different um, developmental motor skill developmental stages that are really important. So they zero month when the baby is born usually in the fetal position also pre-birth in the fetal position and then they develop the extension muscles and then the flexion muscles of the muscle of the tummy and then they can sit and so on and so on and then they can crawl and then they can walk and stand and climb chairs stairs and um, in the end they can walk alone and run around and I loved this image. I don't know. I just got it from Google. I don't know who created it, but it's such a good image. The only one missing is rolling. And the rolling is important for the development of the oblique muscles. So I use the neurodevelopment, which is this, um, in the Kaori Kids program to develop these skills so that the child can be ready to learn. The sensory modulation, let me just go back to the previous slide. Um, this one, I incorporated in the very first Kaori kit I created, but it is so individual. You can, if you talk to people around you, you can talk to anybody and nobody will have exactly the same preferences regarding sensory issues. The one will love a clothes with a satin like feeling the other one will love clothes with a wool feeling so it's just 
we're all different and therefore kids are also different it's very difficult to um put this in a program for a general program for many kids uh, whereas the sensory motor skills as you can see here all children go through the same developmental stages and if they miss one then you see it later on in life and um, so i can with confidence give a motor skill development program to a child um, because they all have to develop all the all the developmental stages and they are in sequence in any person so how do we do that if you look at the baby crawling um, and crawling for us as OTs is a very important phase. The other, the other one is the um, tummy time, because then you develop your extension muscle, muscles, and that helps you to sit upright and to sit still. If you don't have that, you cannot sit still at a table and you wiggle, you stand up, you walk around and you annoy everybody around you. So anyway, let's get back here. So the baby crawling uses the one arm and the opposite opposite leg and if a baby is crawling very well they use these quite fast in a rhythmical sequential way and um, and that is very very important things to master you use the same movements when running so you use your on one arm and the opposite leg and this prepares you for more complex movements like this one is a marching like movement where you can see she's talking where we ask them to either count say the abc recite a poem but have a rhythm and a beat on which you do these exercises because then you catch up with what you might have lost because you did not crawl did not crawl with a good gait or the commander crawling or crawled for a very short period of time as well um, and then they can catch up by doing these activities and um, it's sequential it's rhythmical it uses the two sides of the body with movements together it crosses the midline of the vertical midline of the body which are all very important for the next phase which i said is the perceptual phase that helps you to develop a strong dominant side and then you know where is left and where is right and what is your left hand and where is your right hand and once you know that miraculously you understand the difference between a d and a b a g and a q a o and a a and a w and a m so those are all letters that that kids mix up and they can even read 31 instead of 13 and make huge mistakes with mathematics because they have these reversals and if you go back you most often see that they find it difficult to identify left and right on themselves so the exercises of kaori kids develop these skills as well through exercises and then it helps with the sequences in words because a word is a sequence of letters and that helps with sentence construction it helps with spelling it well helps with understanding mathematics timetables are just sequences if you write your timetable timetables out it's just the one sequence after the other then also they find it then easier to remember events in the correct sequential order so you know if you ask a uh, um eight-year-old what did you do before morning tea at school they will most probably tell you what they did if you ask a three-year-old they wouldn't know and they might even say we going to, we did it tomorrow or you know they mix up days of the week they mix up tomorrow and yesterday and today because that sequence of events has not developed yet but by eight, it should be developed. And you get kids who didn't, um, who can't do that. Um, so anyway, then if they can do this, then it feeds into executive functioning, which is so important later in life. 
Um, your work ethics depends on that, your planning at work, your completion of tasks, your, your general coping. If you don't have executive functioning, you are often anxious and often afraid of what's happening. Um, so my, my example, which I am often um, um, mention, is I saw a boy in therapy and we were doing a lot of these type of exercises, but longer ones. So he had to do a whole sequence of exercises. At the end, he had to do a part of a puzzle and then he had to start again. And I play a metronome. So there's a very specific beat and he has to stay on the beat. Um, he was about eight, nine years old. And, and every time he makes mistakes and every time he cannot stay on the beat and don't, think that I'm asking the child to do that the day they come in for therapy. We build up until I think he's ready for this. And I thought he's ready, but he just couldn't get it. And I thought to myself, if he comes in again and he cannot get it, then I might need to refer him to somebody else because then obviously this time, these techniques which I have used for decades doesn't work so i'll have to consider and i was thinking of where will i send him to and i don't think medication will help what shall we do blah 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 and again i gave him this the uh, not the same exercises i work out a new one every time he comes in but i gave it to him to do and he did it and he repeated and he repeated and he did it all correctly and mum was there and i said to her did you see that I was I was just about to jump through the roof. I was so excited. Um, and she said, oh, yes. And I forgot to tell you that he had full marks in spinning last week. And he moved up two levels in swimming. And that is what happens when the sensory motor skills are well developed. So I will show you the last image, and this is this one, and I hope you can see it, but it's very small because there are so much information that I want to put in here. At the bottom, you get your sensory modulation, discrimination. Then all these orange and yellow are covered by the Kaori Kids exercises. So sequential processing, sequences of movements, of facts, of events, eye movements, um, sense of direction, left and right, balance, timing, coordination, um, visual, auditory and movement integration. Um, and then we get to ideation. I don't cover that in the Kaori Kids program, but when all of these are well developed, you will get there or the child will get there without much more prompting. And then speech and language becomes easy. And then they are often better equipped to control their emotions. Then you get your core executive functions like working memory and the very important inhibitory control to wait before they act, not to rush into everything. And then you get your reasoning, problem solving and planning. And then at the top, you get literacy skills, word decoding, vocabulary, comprehension, all of those skills that they need in the classroom to be able to learn. So it's so important to have this group well developed. And that is why I developed Cody Kids, because I did these exercises from my sensory integration training in my therapy sessions i saw the improvement and i looked at the child and i thought many of these exercises can be done at home and if the parent can do it for two weeks at home then they can reduce their therapy sessions to fortnightly sessions instead of weekly sessions and the child will progress so i have some children that i put in on monthly sessions because the parents are very proactive and they do this very consistently at home. I use it when I can't see a child because they live far away and, and then I do 
on telehealth i do like pencil grip and fine motor i can do on telehealth i cannot do all these exercises so well on telehealth then the mum does that with the child and it leave, gives me time in therapy sessions to focus on other things and then I also use it while the children wait for therapy. I often say, well, while you're waiting for therapy, do this. And then at least you are helped in some way and you have started the progress of getting somewhere in therapy and of development. And the parents are in the process also of doing specific tasks every day. So I hope this helps. And I hope, let me just, um, Yes, stop sharing. Yes. Yeah, I hope this helps and I hope to meet all of you very soon and, and I hope I can share more. This is a very concise, concise summary, but it was just to fit into your meeting today. Thank you so much for listening. I'm looking forward to meet all of you. Goodbye.